Good afternoon. Today is May 27th, Friday. Uh, this is United Medical ACO. My name is Kamal Erkan. I'm here with Sean Dargo. Sean, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good, good. Uh, we are going to go ahead and start our weekly event. Um, uh, we do have some new updates uh, from last week. Um, we'll be able to talk about those as well as the uh, update from our RCM team uh, for the patient inquiries and uh, statements. Uh, Sean, we have updates from our uh, two senators, state senators, they are confirmed. Yes, so we have June 10th is going to be Senator Kyle Gay rescheduling from last week. Mm -hmm. And then the following week on the 17th, we do have Brian Townsend who will be joining us. So we'll have back to back weeks uh, with two senators on. So. Okay. Yep. Good. So let's go ahead and start with our uh, COVID update. Sure. Um, and then we have a lot of different things to talk about today. So we do. We do have a lot. Uh, uh, lined up for us, so I'll try to be quick and effective here with our COVID update to start off. Um, we're just going to point out that the U.S. is now on average, uh, this is updated as of 526, we had an average of over 100,000 cases now of coronavirus on the daily. I do know that there was articles that there was one day, I think, where they tested over 200,000. Yes. Uh, but I believe the number they're taking here is the weekly average, so that might be why it's lower, mm -hmm. but um, definitely an increase on the daily cases. And I, I think that's just going to be um, the new reality. So the good news is the cases are not so severe. So, right. um, but because there are so many of them, they may end up uh, in, they may actually end up going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So maybe one reminder for people is uh, if, unless you have a, a real emergency, try to stay away from yeah. the hospitals. So. That's something that we've been uh, we have been saying for a long time, but I think as people got more comfortable, they actually ended up going back to the hospitals. Hospitals are not to get uh, routine care; um, uh, they are not your primary care providers. So uh, stay away from the hospitals if you don't have a real emergency. But what else do we have? Yeah. Um... With the vaccination rate, we're up at almost 90% of the country's population now having received uh, at least one dose. And then, as always, we do compare the state of Delaware to the country as a whole. Um, so as a nation, we are at over 221 million people uh, having been fully vaccinated now. Mm -hmm. so that's steadily increasing by about a million and a half, two million a uh, week, which is good to see. And then down below, um, we are being provided, again, these last few weeks with the number of people receiving their booster dose. Uh, so we have 103 who have gotten one and then just over 13 and a half million having received a second uh, booster shot. Uh, as for the state of Delaware, it is increasing around one tenth of percent steadily in each of those categories. However, the uh, age group over 65 has actually gone up three tenths. So they're mm -hmm. actually uh, rapidly increasing. So they're almost good. at 96 percent. So. Now, as we maybe are kind of getting uh, the COVID under control, under control. Although I say I, it's under control, but um, with the 200,000 cases, uh, there are some schools now that are mandating masks indoor. Yep. Um, but I guess people are knowledgeable enough to kind of know what they should be doing, hopefully after two years of torture. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have a new um, problem uh, as we promised last week, we were going to give updates on the monkeypox. So, uh, so what do we know about the monkeypox and uh, how this is affecting the United States, if it's affecting the United States, and how we can actually prepare? And many of these uh, new topics, we try to actually um, uh, we try to be ahead of the game, yeah. but then. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen from the state right. and the federal level, but go ahead. Right. So uh, just on a recap, though, we know that the monkeypox was uh, originating um, in the highest concentration. I believe it was the UK and Spain that were seeing the most uh, cases initially. It did come over. We have some in the US, Canada. So we are on the lookout. Uh, I know that there's been uh, alerts and notifications sent out to PCP uh, providers, you know, if they have anyone who has a suspicious rash or, or symptoms you know that that is something now to consider because if you look back at covid like you said trying to get ahead a lot of the people who may have been going to their doctor 
who may have actually had COVID at the time, you know, we weren't aware of it's a thing. So they're being, oh, it's, you might have uh, pneumonia if you're coughing a lot or something else, whereas actually it could have been COVID the whole time. So mm-hmm. uh, I think like you're saying, trying to get ahead if we're notifying these practices uh, to be on the alert for monkeypox. That way if something does look suspicious or it could be, you know, deemed it is in fact monkeypox, they're aware ahead of time. Uh, so as us at United Medical, we did reach out to our uh, medical director, Dr. Rick Hong, who actually we had on the program previous times, uh, trying to see what the state of Delaware is doing to get an advanced proactive approach to this. And um, he did respond that there was a HAN sent out on Friday. Uh, so that was actually by the state of Massachusetts. And then it was across uh, on, a, on a nation uh scale so and the the HAN team. is for health alert network health alert network correct uh, so uh, it was a little bit disappointing uh, that he agreed. just referred us to some generic updates so we were actually reaching out to him as united medical aco uh, you know time to time we have to remind people that we represent at the primary care level 115000 patients altogether close to 250000 active patients and 90% of these people live in Delaware. So if we have that type of responsibility, um, just like we did with the COVID uh, in the beginning, um, we wanna be ahead of the game before it actually starts spreading. So, um, I mean, I don't wanna be referred to the the generic website by our state director. I mean, he was with us twice uh, in the past, and I know he knows better, but not sure why we didn't get a solid right. update. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons I asked you guys to reach out to him was because Germany ordered 40,000 doses yes. of the vaccine for the monkeypox. It's not the, it's yeah, not for so, monkeypox, but it is uh, preventive. Yeah, it was Bavarian Nordic uh, vaccine. So for those that don't know, the monkeypox symptoms and uh, I guess, you know, scientific evidence is actually a lot similar to that of smallpox. We know that those eradicated. So those uh, symptoms who may be similar to smallpox, doctors uh, in the field are are thinking that anyone who has similarities resembling smallpox, it could in fact end up being the monkeypox, uh, as if there's a lot of similarities. So that vaccine is against the Bavarian Nordic, and that was Germany that uh, ordered over 40,000 doses uh, as a precaution. So seeing that, again, going back to us here at UMACO, trying to get ahead, what is the state of Delaware specifically doing to be referred? It was kind of a letdown, I would say, mm-hmm. but obviously here we did follow up. I did research into the, the HAN and we were able to read. So if you do see in that uh, slide there, there is uh, a little bit of information on just what exactly the HAN was and the summary that the Massachusetts Department of Public Health so, I mean, if this is happening in Europe, that means it's traveling to us, yes. right? So, uh, or if it's happening in any part of the world, it is um, actually, it's going to come here yeah, at some yes. point. Yeah. Um, I don't want to find that out after it's already infected, like hundreds, uh, 100 or 200 people. Mm-hmm. So that's that's just going to be, uh, that's going to be wrong. Now, one other thing, let me see if I can actually, you know, I did so many uh, notes for this meeting um there was a discussion well with bill gates who actually apparently he was giving this speech on mighty punks in march so you know we are always kind of like every time something happens with bill gates we are like oh my god did he do this to us i don't know why why he would do it he wouldn't so that's that's just it's just like just like the way that we talk about these things ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So if something is coming to us, yeah. and if we are telling you this is a heads up, this is coming, this doesn't mean that we are just setting you up for some yeah, failure. It's, it's not empty air. It definitely has significance behind what we are saying. So again, with him, people could say coincidence, or you know, is it something that they're looking at the mm-hmm. trends on previous viral uh, infections? Of, yeah. you know, what are similarities? And, oh, all right. Well, if this happened with this, you know, COVID, here's another one that could potentially. So, so absolutely. So let me actually, uh, yeah, this is um, uh, Bill Gates warns uh, of, well, actually it was a sm- small pox terror attack. So that he was talking about uh, possible monkeypox terror attacks announced by Bill Gates in November, 2021. So 
I mean, yeah, people that get real. So, um, well, we'll have Richa join us uh, today. Um, and Rich, I know, is watching because we couldn't figure out how to hide people right. when they are reading in the waiting room. So we told them not to just sign in. So Rich, if you are able to hear us, um, you can just sign into the Zoom. So while she's doing that, uh, I can share. Uh... Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, I will quickly uh, change my background here so everyone can see. It has some exciting. Did I cover me up uh, that way? Right, I'm letting her in, but you can go ahead. Oh, I don't know if he's going to be able to see. I'm trying to cover something. No, you see it. You see it. You see it. I'll duck out. But. <laughs> Yes, Kamal, the award winner. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, we do have a little synopsis there. Uh, you can able to put this together for us with the, uh, the YWCA and the most impactful man. Um, man of distinction. Man of distinction. Yeah. So this is actually the first time they did it, and it's uh, obviously it's a great honor. Um, so you're fine. You're fine. So look, they see it. Now they, um, well, YWC is extremely important for us. Um, uh, Rich, I, you are able to come in here. So YWC is an extremely important co um, organization for us. Uh, I, I've been working with them for the last 11 years, I believe. Um, honestly, um, uh, when this is the charity that we are involved, so we don't expect anything from them. I mean, it's the other way around, and we want to do more. And when this came up, um, uh, I was uh, I was extremely happy, and it's a it's a great honor. And it's I think it's the first time they do this for um, this is a it's an organization with um, uh, women who are um, having domestic violence issues, right. but the organization itself, YWCA, is such a great organization in a way that what support they are providing is not a permanent for a person to be depending on the support that they are getting, but it's transitional. Yeah. So then it's from day one, that was why we actually uh, realized that that's the right way to help. So it's a transitional support that's gonna be permanent with people. Yeah. And that was the main thing uh, that made YWCA our official charity. And I do want to thank them to recognize our efforts. Um, it was nice to our directors uh, were there with us. Dr. Ergao, Dr. Wynn, they were also there. They're all supporting. This is not just one person doing it. Um, but that was a good night there. All right, well, Richa, um, how are you doing? I'm good. Do I look like Carlos? <laughs> we were able to update the name. <laughs> no, you <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> so, Carlos is a little bit prettier. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, thank you for being available. Uh, we had a little bit last minute change, and uh, so this is why it's so great to have uh, a huge team with what we do behind us. And we are able to just step up when or step in when it's needed. And so you are actually here uh, to discuss the RCM uh, patient inquiry online tool statement. This is more for our patients and also for our clients so they know what's available to them. Correct, correct. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about the patient inquiry tool and also the statements itself, like how we send them, what the process is. So uh, I'll just jump right in, Kamal. Um, so usually that patient responsibility part of it or the sending the statements part is sort of at the end of our process. So we go through an entire process of uh, getting claims you know, through the insurance, making sure we're working on denials, uh, et cetera, et cetera, before we get to the point where we actually build a patient. So that statement process comes 
last. Now, sometimes we do have to send statements or letters to patients in the middle of our process if we happen to be missing information, right? So that's that's something we do do. We'll drop a balance to the patient to get their attention and we'll say, hey, we need your insurance information or we want to make sure that your name is displayed correctly. Uh, those are some of the reasons why we would send something uh, prior to the process being completed. Mm -hmm. uh, the next part of this is also making sure we're sending statements to the right folks. So we usually submit these statements in a batch. So we go through a list of all of the patients that are eligible to be billed and we process them, we process them through our practice management system. Uh, and we identify essentially that we make sure that we've at least, um, you know, done our due diligence before we go ahead and, and send those statements out to the patient. Um, now we do send anywhere from a minimum of two statements, sometimes more. Uh, there are some practices where we send three statements or possibly four, but our standard is usually at least two to three. And on those statements, we include patient information that's important for them, their account number, when their bill is due, uh, you know, when they're expected to pay, uh, essentially what their balance is, what it's for, and um, kind of just an explanation of what it is that they're they're receiving, why they're receiving that bill. Um, and our, and our, our statements are pretty easy, uh, clear to read, uh, has practice information on it, you know, who's sending you the bill, what the amounts are, that kind of stuff. Um, also, our patients do have an option to receive electronic statements uh, directly to their email address if they choose to do so. But normally, our process at United Medical, uh, our standard process is to send the patients paper statements, which many people still want. Um, so then the next part of this is essentially the online patient option. So on the statements, we've included a link, it's a billing.umusa.net. It's a link that takes you to our patient inquiry. So this essentially helps patients who want to avoid making that phone call, uh, an opportunity to ask questions about their bills directly online. So we've kind of made that the forefront of the statement, you know, kind of highlighting that option versus calling us, uh, just because we find it to be a very efficient way to answer the questions for the, from the patients. Mm -hmm. So they can fill out their question. Uh, we do have a form that, that allows them to ask questions about balance disputes, uh, FMLA, uh, paying a bill, um, a payment that's potentially missing that they've already paid, uh, setting up a payment plan, uh, requesting uh, information from us, uh, st uh, requesting a statement from us, maybe if they haven't even received one. So there's a lot of different options on the inquiry screen. And also we have some clinical options as well. I think mm -hmm. uh, also the uh, wellness groups, I think you're able to uh, go on and put a patient inquiry for those if you want more information on those. Um, so, um, Richard, what, um, what I would like to do is just share my screen for a second. If I'm a patient, if I don't have any of this, inform this information that you just provided, um, mm -hmm. and if we were to kind of navigate this together, uh, just sure. assume that I'm a 77-year-old uh, Karen. Um, well, do we have 77-year-old? <laughs> I don't <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, so this is our website, um, okay. right? So, well, I don't know anything about what you just said because I'm not listening. Uh, so then, oh, I see the four patients options here. Right. So I think that makes the most sense. So I'm going to go to that. So then from that, um, well, this seems like the most logical answer. Right. Um, so now the, before I do that, I just want to make sure that I'm on a private browser. So then it's not, uh, where do I make this? Uh, so let me just do this. So sorry, guys. So um, uh, all right. So now, now it's like that way. I'm not signed into our system. 
Okay, so then this first option it seems like the most logical to me, and then I go there. And yeah. okay, so it says, please select your confirmation preference. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to read. Yes, I would like to receive an email. No, I don't want to receive an email. Yes, I would like to receive an email. Reason for an inquiry, right? So these are my options. These are your options. So this, is, this is the actual live uh, database. So right now we are not demoing, right? So then, um, so like if they want to, instead of just calling us and then waiting for 25 minutes for someone to answer and then ending up just vo uh, leaving a voicemail, it's much better to just go here and then do this information right here and then pick the practice. Um, yeah, so this is a list of all of our doctors. Now, sometimes if they're not able to find their doctor or they don't know, we have that little box next to it that says unable to find doctor. I think sometimes patients fill things in there. So yeah, this is pretty easy. So, yeah. right? That's your, so then, yeah. So because it's, you chose the insurance info one, it's going to ask you for your insurance ID. Sure. Um, that, that just gives us the most basic information we need on our side to be able to verify that your insurance is actually active. Um, mm -hmm. No, this is good. And as soon as I do say this, so I should be getting a confirmation ID. And, and, uh, but it does say that don't call the office because you're going to, well, there's the vaccine stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a, a standard uh, yeah. from the but COVID, just, yeah. <laughs> I know that I just got the email. Um, so, but that's about it, right? So. That is correct, yep. Oops. And once we've resolved it as well, Kamal, once we've resolved that inquiry that you just put in, uh, because you put your email in, we can also email you the uh, resolution. So for that particular one, it's, it's quite easy. If you do have your insurance information, you end up entering it on that form and we're able to verify it. We probably will never have to call you. Uh, we would just resolve to take it on our side. We, on our side, we would resubmit the claim and we would shoot you out an email letting you know that your ticket has been resolved and what that resolution is. We actually type those in ourselves. They're not automated. So the rep who's working on your inquiry would type in exactly what they did uh, and you would receive that in your email. Well, uh, that seems pretty uh, easy to use. And then it, they would save a lot of time, but um, we would probably, the patients are getting their answers in like 24 to 48 hours the latest. Correct, right? no, as long as we can, as long as we can resolve it. Now, the only other issue sometimes we do run across them all is people leave their phone number, but often they don't have a voicemail set up or they have a voicemail inbox that's completely full, or they you know, continuously kind of ignore our calls because they perhaps don't know the number, that kind of thing. So in those cases, we do uh, reach out to the patient. We attempt multiple times to reach out to the patient to assure we've tried to do our due diligence to get in contact with them for their inquiry. Um, no, that's, um, that is, very helpful. Um, and then I think now more and more patients are using it. A hundred percent. We've had a huge, we've had a huge influx of patients who are using this. They're using it if effectively. Uh, we are getting much less call volume due to this. Uh, and the nice thing about it is the information is right there, right? It's typed in from the patient versus if you're trying to speak to someone on the phone, there may be some miscommunication. You know, maybe mm -hmm. you may not understand the patient, the patient may not understand the representative. There's a lot of room for, um, you know, issues that may come up on those calls. Whereas in this format, it's very easy for us to see the information most of the time. Um, and you know how you had to navigate to the website. However, directly on the statements, it is the exact website link. So they don't even have to go to the United Medical website at all. It directly takes them to that inquiry page that you went to mm -hmm. from our website. Um, so try to make it as easy as possible to go ahead and do that. And, and the other thing I wanted to mention is oh, many of our practices have a patient payment online option. So what we've done through the patient inquiry, which I think is very nice, is even though it's on the statement, 
as to where they can go to pay their bill, perhaps they miss that and they say, oh, I want to pay my bill and they go to the, you know, they go to our site to put it in inquiry. But when you click that pay, pay a bill option, if that particular practice has a pay, pay online site, it will automatically give you the link to that and it'll directly, uh, it will direct you to that site and you can just pay your payment there. So it makes it really easy. We're trying to, we're improving it always, but we're trying to make it so that it's very user friendly and it directs patients exactly where they need to go. So that's, uh, that again, that makes the, um, our interaction with the patients from the billing end, it makes it a lot um, more efficient. Um, patients don't want to be called, I mean, uh, on the case conference, I can give you an example from the clinical side. When we called the patient for the um, follow-ups, uh, Sean uh, would know uh, because he's in, the, in those meetings with us. So sometimes they're, they're at their office. So they're not able to talk. So, or like, I mean, patients are not like, we are not a hospital, our patients are not in the hospital when we call them. So they're, they're, they're living their lives. So uh, it's also not most convenient for them. Uh, I think that makes it a lot more efficient and productive and, um, and hopefully more people can use. And I mean, the, from my personal um, work that I do with different, like when I'm when this is available to me, I just don't want to talk to anyone. So this is the best thing uh, that I can just Plus, do. Plus, you're not gonna play phone tag either. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, and we're becoming a society that's more pro to you know wanting to use these types of options yeah. versus. Um, and and I don't think that it's just the young people. I think there's a lot of elderly people who prefer to do online, you know, I mean, very recently, my dad was like, okay, I want to, after what, 20 something years, <laughs> and probably more than that, like some of these have been available, he wants to make everything automated. He's like, oh, I want to have everything paid directly from my bank account um, versus opening up my giant checkbook and <laughs> writing the checks and sending them out. So I think everyone is coming around to this idea of, you know, online options to, go ahead and take care of your day-to-day, -day, you know, your day-to-day -day activities that you need to take care of, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, that is, that is the case. Well, um, Richard, um, thank you for being available at uh, a short notice and uh, being with us, so it's always fun. Um, so we'll keep going with the other stuff, so uh, okay. we'll see you soon. Thank you, Kamal, thanks for having me. I'll be watching you thank guys. You. bye bye. Okay, bye bye. So Sean, what is our next? Are we doing the global conflict? Are we doing the gun? Are we doing the military spending? Yes. So I did. Uh, I did prepare ample topics for us here, so that way we have our, our choice. So if you want to throw the the names in a hat there and pick whichever one, uh, I'm ready. But uh, <laughs> I mean, slide wise, next up we did have our global current events, which is kind okay. Of let's do that. So yeah, it's kind of focusing on. Uh, inflation again the economy so this is probably a, in terms of the time uh, the different stuff that's happening i think it's amazing that i wish that i didn't have to see in my lifetime so uh but i guess uh, we have to see these and then we have to deal with these now uh, what we are seeing is uh, and many people uh, outside of this country they don't really understand what they are going through but this type of inflation is not something that we are used to. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, our president really also doesn't understand that this inflation is not good for us. And then he's describing this as a uh, incredible transition for Americans must go through. Well, transition to what? Something worse. Do you, maybe I was looking for Sean to give me an answer, right, well, but it doesn't seem like he has the answer. Right? I don't know if anyone does. I mean, it's it doesn't look like too bright of a horizon if you see a bunch of different warning signs of you know a serious recession and the fact that even inflation. If you look at some of his past interviews, he said uh, that people who are thinking inflation is due to government spending are wrong, which that's incorrect. It is our government is now. You know, we recently mentioned how we'd sent aid to Ukraine. Uh, it was 40 something billion dollars. And as always, we do have later on, I had mentioned our, our world debt clock again. And 
it's insane in the trillions. And the fact of government spending, this inflation is just not helping. It's just digging a deeper hole. So this incredible transition. So uh, why we are saying that, right? So Sean, uh, when we are, by the way, we go, uh, we are, yeah, we are yeah. going through some storm. It has nothing transition. to do with Biden. It's just the natural event. So I don't know if people can hear it, but in case we lose connection or something, that does happen in the United States also. Not as often as it happens in Turkey, but it's pretty long. We'll, we'll keep going. So now one, um, well, why we are again talking about these things and uh, two weeks ago, um, I'm not really happy that I said that, but it is something that needed to be said. We, what I said, it, I think the third, um, um, the yeah. um, World War Three started. Correct. So this was two weeks ago. What worries me the most, uh, two weeks after, 10 days after what I said, what I said, uh, Soros comes out yes. and then he's actually uh, validating right. what I said. And I don't want to be in that position. Uh, I have nothing to do with this guy. But also, what what I'm what I'm understanding now is what I was afraid of is real. Yes, you're on the right track. So, is this war for covering up for the um, bad politics? I I get the feeling uh, that that is kind of the case. So our president's uh, approval rate is thirty six percent. Uh, not something to be proud of. Not. Uh, usually, I mean, they can hit those low numbers, but this is unusual for someone who... Yeah, it's it's been a steady decline, too. It's, <clears throat> it's, we can see if it was fluctuating or uh, certain incidents, but... Uh, so we are, not only we are worried, but we are also, um, the concern is, like, the other thing is that we don't know what to do. What's next? Like, what should we be doing? Like, how we should be preparing for this? So when you are being distracted with different things, I mean, we are smart people. We can actually kind of process what's given to us, right? So uh, what I don't understand is why are we not being honest with public? Why do we need to be in Ukraine? Why do we need to be in Taiwan? Why do we need to be in all these places that is going to put us in huge uh, risk in why, one way or the other? So that's kind of like what we are trying to understand here. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, the global economy and the fact that you don't have to have relations, you know, in modern day, that is given. We need to be a little bit louder. Oh, sure. No, <laughs> Ray, Ray really. doesn't want to hear what I have to say. Um, but obviously, you know, the global market and the economy, is, there are times when you will need to get involved with foreign affairs. But I think being able to select and certain approaches, um, differentiating what type of approach is needed for which scenario is important, but also, like you're saying, to be open with the public and kind of just be real, you know, this is why this is happening and here's what we're going to do to try to mitigate or expedite or whatever your approach is to the particular situation. So with this going on with the inflation, you know, some people are saying that the best way is for the Fed to be more aggressive and we're not seeing a definitive solution proposed yet. So I guess like what um, one of the concerning things for me again uh, like I don't know how many times I said concerning. Um, so the picture actually I'm just sharing the picture now. What you see on the top uh, top left is from 2016, and I think we were just kind of like loosely using this um, uh, World War Three. So, but that was 2016. Interestingly, how media works, so then they put Turkey right in the middle of it. That's a shame. Well, the Turkey is the peacemaker uh, today with what's happening. But then Turkey is being pushed to make some decisions uh, not going to be favorable to them. And But in 2016, we were in the middle of the um, equation for... Uh, well, Erdogan was in the middle of this equation saying that he's going to be the reason for the uh, uh, for this war. That's not the case. So five, six years later, what we see is uh, this is already almost um, uh, projected. It was already scripted. So then we are just waiting for those players to 
just make their own mistakes or play their parts. Yeah. And that, that's kind of, in my opinion, is kind of disgusting. Now, uh, I just want to give you a couple of examples. Like being here for 23 years, uh, I would consider myself, um, this is my home. United States is my home. Um, so, but we also, we are not, um, I mean, we are intelligent people. We can process what's given to us. So here's the thing. So there's NATO. NATO is supposed to be the group of uh, NATO uh, countries supposed to be protecting each other. And, and that's also not happening, by the way. So just to give some credit to Trump, he called them out uh, in his, I believe, last year that they were, NATO was not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the United States was doing the most funding. Uh, mm-hmm. Turkey is the second biggest uh, military power in NATO. Now, there's this Ukraine conflict started. Turkey has nothing to do with it, and they don't want that type of a conflict because they work with Ukraine and Russia. Then, now all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, Sweden and Finland wants to join NATO. These two countries who are funding terrorism in Turkey with the Kurdish um, groups, and now they want to be part of NATO. That's like disgusting, shameful, and it shouldn't be happening. But then the way that we are putting Turkey in that type of situation, now Turkey is going to make a mistake or yeah. Turkey is going to be pushed to make a mistake. Yeah. It's going to be another reason for tension being increased to a level that now there is yeah. no going back. Why? And why is this happening? Well, like you're saying, there's, there's these pressure points that I think, you know, you're saying if it's a script, if you're looking at 2016 and like you're saying, is that a coincidence on timing that now all of a sudden Finland and Sweden just so conveniently are trying to join. And like you're saying, it feels like Turkey maybe is cornered where you don't have the luxury of, you know, there's many different options to choose where, you know, geographically they're positioned, but also politically where they're kind of forced to play this card as opposed to being able to have the freedom of, you know, the way that they're not being, like you mentioned the European Union, mm-hmm. um, how they're trying to join. And, but Turkey is being um, kept yeah, out of the European exactly. Union for years and years and years, yes. and they won't let let them in. Yep. I mean, uh, well, it's I would consider European Union a religious uh, organization or union. Mm-hmm. Turkey is not the right fit for them. It's not going to happen. Okay, so That's given good. because if Bulgaria is part of it, why Turkey is or Greece? Greece is like um, the economy is so bad. Uh, right. They they can pay their debt in the next five years if they don't do anything, and then from their uh, gross domestic product, it's not going to pay what they owe in the next five six years if they spend the entire amount for that. So they are right. good fit for um, okay. apparently right? right. So, but then this big country is not because well there are obvious reasons. Well, if, look if it doesn't work out, then just be open. But Right now, the reason we are talking about this is it's affecting our economy here. So the gas, the lowest gas price is $4.65. Now, I would never pay attention to this until four months ago. And I'm like a crazy Japanese tourist that taking pictures of the gas prices. This is what's happening. So to cover up this, if you need to just uh, get our attention somewhere else, I don't think that's the right thing to do. We need to focus on what's happening here in the United States. And, uh, you know, by saying this, maybe I'm, I, I may regret with what I'm saying, but we are almost missing Trump days. So at least his focus was in the United States. Yeah. So here I just said it, so I can't take that back. But I did not support him. So, all right. Um, yeah. At so, least we are doing what we need to, right? So... Um, right, and, and to mention, you know, just uh, for some of the viewers who've seen those slides there too, we did have included even the military spending um, versus the GDP and some of the graphs we're looking at where you're comparing what the U.S. Uh, ends up committing towards this military spending and, and what we're seeing going on in you know, Asia with Japan being so close to China and then China with Russia and then trying to potentially end up annexing, you know, Taiwan. Mm-hmm. So we have that agreement, which... For those who are following the news, Joe Biden did say that you know we, we are committed to to uh, defending them should they try anything. Uh, but if, if you're looking at these slides here, uh, what Taiwan does bring with their percentage of the GDP with that increase 
um, is the, the graph. I think it's like the fourth slide there, but you'll see the insane increase uh, trend line going straight up and it's predicted, you know, for 2022, they did extrapolate it a little bit further there, but just their population versus their GDP. And then you look at- It's 23 million uh, people, right? The total is yeah. 23 million. Uh, and then so, yeah. their GDP, uh, GDP is um, almost, they're in the top 20. Yeah. Like, their um, right. economy is so, in the top 20. Now, I think the point that we, are to, we were trying to make, um, so uh, Sean and I, we were actually just prepped to some of these discussions. We are doing a lot of uh, readings and uh, what I was explaining to him, like why Taiwan would be so important for China, because this little, very little part of uh, that country is, is in top 20 yeah. in the world. 23 million. Very so there's 1.4 billion Chinese. And then, yes, they're maybe number two, I believe. But if uh, that means they're doing something so efficiently there, mm -hmm. and if someone is trying to take that away from them or right. trying to control them or get into their face, things are going to escalate. And how many other uh, you know, issues, uh, how many other troubles do we have to start to cover up the economy? Focus on the economy. Like, just focus on the economy. Um, but I don't think we are doing that. Um, I'm kind of sick of seeing um, all these troubles in different parts of the world. That's kind of uh, some, in one way or the other, we are involved. And right. yet we are paying almost $5 for gas. I mean, that's, that's affecting the electricity, uh, all the other utilities. Now, we have patients who live on a limited income. So a lot of them. A lot of older uh, elderly are over 65. So, Jean, I'll tell you something. And, um, in the beginning of the ACO, okay, so uh, we, uh, like, I think it was 2016 or 17. So, one of the things that I was uh, focusing on, just trying to master the, um, let me actually just take this picture off. So one of, the, um, uh, one of the things that we were focusing on, I was just saying that, look, there are elderly over 65, but there, there must be a very limited number of people over 85 mm -hmm. in our ACO, uh, the kind of care organization. So that time we had 11,000 patients. And then I was just gonna um, look at those people and then we would just assign them to one person. Mm -hmm. So, because I thought it was so little, people right. over 85. Mm -hmm. It was 12% of the total was uh, over 85. In fact, we had one of the patients who was 98. I don't know if she's still there. She, her lab work, uh, the blood results was so healthy. There is no way that she was going anywhere. Yeah. The reason I'm saying is because those people do live on limited budget. When things are increasing and when we are not increasing what they make, then this is affecting our patients. So we are not talking politics just because of it. I mean, I can do that with Dr. Erga on a Sunday or with Sean on a Sunday. That's different. We are talking about this because it's affecting the society day by day, uh, every minute it's, it's getting into our system. Yeah. So once this becomes a chronic problem, it's gonna be difficult to get out of it. I know that from my other experience from my other country. So it doesn't go away when you have that problem. Yeah, and I think the, the alarming thing too is with some of this, like you're saying, the impact on the patients, there's somewhere, you know, if one one more thing happens to them, it could be catastrophic, you know, where, where they're, already, they're already walking a fine line trying to manage, you know, multiple uh, illnesses with this medication. They're already, you know, trying to make ends meet. And it's, you know, one, the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, or if you just add now, it's, Oh, everything's going to cost more than this and they're unable to i can't afford this medication or i can't afford to eat healthy it's that could actually have catastrophic events to their health absolutely and that's that's why we uh, we are trying to bring these issues up so that uh, they don't people don't understand uh, these are just politics it's not it's affecting us so now speaking of affecting us and then speaking of the limited time we did have um uh, based on what happened the last episode in Texas. Um, 
the mass shootings in the United States. Um, so this is something that actually in the um, developed countries, uh, we are the only country who have this, this problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I was not born here, but I was here before you were, you were born. Mm -hmm. So you were or, or about that, that time. So you, someone who's, who was born here, uh, give us a little bit background on that. And then uh, maybe we, we, we may need to discuss this next yeah. week, uh, but let's just have an opening and then we'll come to you sure. next week. Well, I know, uh, you know, with this debate on the gun control, a lot of people always say, you know, with the amendment where it is your right and the government shouldn't be able to take that away. And then we have other people who, uh, on, the, on the other side, feel like people shouldn't have access, you know, to certain firearms at all. But I think what's going to end up happening is there's going to be sort of a compromise in the middle where, you know, there may be a little bit more extensive background check and screenings to see, you know, are these people uh, mentally... Uh, stable to be able to possess, you know, firearms. And, and again, on what type, where is it, you know, say a, a single shot pistol for self-defense or is it a, you know, an automatic assault rifle, Semi -automatic. you know, with an extended clip where it's, what is the actual purpose on why you need to possess uh, something with that type of firearm? And also age, age restriction, right? So yeah. the 18 year old shouldn't be given a semi-automatic uh, gun. Right. So he shouldn't so, have access to that. But I think, um, you know, one thing that uh, it should be also clear that the United States is not like France or it's not like England, it's not like Germany. We are, uh, we are a rich country. So uh, I don't know if you traveled to, uh, well, you probably did because of your sports, right? Uh, have you been in Arkansas? I have not been in Arkansas. I did. So <laughs> it's a scary place. It's next on my list. It, it can be a scary place if you're not from there. Right. But also you can understand the dynamics once you are there. Well, yeah, there's definitely different cultures. You know, like you're saying, the United States is very big, very diverse, and, you know, different cultures in different uh, geographical regions. You, you know, you think of urban and, and northeast mid-Atlantic versus how the way of life is maybe in the deep south where, you know, even, even when there's no access to, to the police. Yeah, you know, where yeah, you may be protect yourself. Yeah, one sheriff over, you know, thousands of people in the town versus, you know, an urban area that have. So, you know, my feeling, and we will discuss this um, more in depth next week, but my feeling is just like any other issue, just like the abortion issue, just like the other political issues, this becomes like out of like the reaction is out of proportion. Mm -hmm. The uh, gun control, uh, yes, uh, there has to be uh, better, maybe, law that protects uh, everyone. Like 18 year old and the um, going through certain uh, process, into, including your mental um, uh, stability. Um, there has to be a process and what type of gun that someone is getting. But taking the gun away from people who's uh, yeah. who's in this country, that's not going to be an easy. That's not what mass shooting is happening. Right. So yeah, that's think, not the solution. I think people are mixing these two things and. Uh, I mean, I have done uh, so much uh, research on this in the last several years. Uh, I own uh, three guns. Um, I have a concealed weapon license. Um, I have to protect myself. Yeah. Now, well, I didn't get it when I was 18. Uh, and I wouldn't get it. Or I wouldn't uh, authorize someone to get it at age 18. And the process shouldn't be this easy, but that doesn't mean that the mass shooting is happening. That's not. Mass shooting is happening because of the mental um, crisis, um, mental health crisis that we are going through, because killing someone at that level, killing eight, nine years old, and uh, just because, just because, that's not because that person had a gun. Mm -hmm. no, so I that person had a mental illness. Yeah, there's something deeper there. And uh, you know, like you're saying, where you don't want to take away other people's rights to, you know, there's plenty of people in the country who are very stable mentally or well aware of, you know, gun mm -hmm. safety, how to use it, you know, and, and how to mitigate conflict. And, you know, there's certain precautions and, and lessons in schooling that people are educated on with this. But at the same time, like you're saying, people may be mixing these two things. And it's they, they are. They are definitely mixing it. Like the, Tex the Texan former congressman just you know, interrupting yeah. the press conference and then making a political show is not the right way to address these issues. 
So uh, no one is talking about the mental health problem, but then they're all saying that, oh, let's just give the guns back. Who's going to protect the people? This country is not France. The France is just the little country that's packed. Everyone is there, uh, and the police is there. Yeah. We are not that. So um, unless we deal with the issue at a broader level, but the restriction should be there. So I just want to make sure that my message is clear. What I'm saying is there should be a higher restriction on the uh, on getting it done. Like you shouldn't be able to just go in and give your license and you're 18 and then you just you get approved in 30 minutes. That's how the process is. That shouldn't be. But uh, the opposite of like similar to the, I think we may lose power, similar to the, um, uh, you know, the abortion issue. It's not like either all or not. That shouldn't be right. And so um, I think like, like you're saying too, since the U.S. is so big, a lot of these issues are, you know, state by state will have different rulings where, you know, gun, gun accessibility is way you know, more difficult in certain areas. Whereas if you go to the deep south, you know, maybe more lenient. The same thing you're saying with the abortion where, you know, culture and, and different regions of the country, are, it's entirely different. So to have one over, over our gene, say this is how it is everywhere, you know, people live different lifestyles in different areas. And, like you're saying, you know, have a peace of mind where, you know, I may need this to protect myself. You know, if you have that is one marshal overseeing 2,000 people in a town versus an urban area where you have, you know, multiple officers in one vehicle at a time. You know, it, it also I mean, the mass shooting shouldn't be discussed in the same sense with the uh, gun control. There are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of politicians who are making these um, like scenes they are just wrong uh, they don't understand the problem but anyway so in three minutes we'll talk about sex <laughs> for patients with morbid obesity um with dr irga dr irga does not know the topic yet but he will find out in a couple of minutes uh, we'll be back uh, well uh, this is the long weekend uh, yes. memorial weekend yeah, and fun, please yeah. uh, if you are traveling be safe and we'll be back next Friday. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.